And everyone, my name is Seni Tavares. I'm the chair of the Legal Studies Department here at ASA College, uh, the College of Choice. I just first want to welcome all of you, our students. I see some familiar names. Uh, thank you for joining us. As promised, um, we said that we would start speaking about issues that are relevant and current in the legal studies and criminal justice field. But before I introduce our uh, very own Professor Moreno, I wanted to explain the way in which we're going to conduct um, this conference. Uh, I want to welcome and thank Dennis Capouche, who is the Director of Marketing Social Media, who was responsible for putting this together and inviting all of you and helping us with the vision and his team. Thank you so much, Dennis for all your anyway, guidance and help. And um, it's our pleasure to have you today. We hope you get the value out of today's topic with our um, our favorite professor, Carlos Morena. So Thank welcome you. everyone, we're very excited. <laughs> Thank you. So the way we're gonna conduct this conference, let's begin by doing the conference and we're gonna hold a few minutes at the end to, um, have some questions regarding relevant to freedom of speech and assembly. Um, I want to um, truly thank Professor Moreno, who I hired uh, for this department, and it, he really has outdone himself. Students love him, has great knowledge of the subject matter. Um, he teaches both in the criminal justice and paralegal studies, as, as some of you may know already. If you're a new student, this is a taste of what the college can offer you. In addition to the classroom experience and the credits that you need to go to the you know, four-year degree, or you wanna to go to law school, or you're an exchange student, or a, you know, a student from another country that came to the US, um, a foreign student that wants to pursue the same career you had, whether you were a lawyer or in law enforcement in your own country, um, this is what we do in addition to the classroom, we believe in real life experiences and also talking about issues that impact um, the criminal justice system as well as the legal system. As I said before, a lot of these um, amazing topics um, are being tested today as we speak. As you know, we had the movement or we have the movement Black Lives Matters and a lot of protesting in the city and it speaks to freedom of, of speech and assembly. And so um, with that being said, um, it's a great time to be a criminal justice or legal studies student. And so this is just a segue. Um, so if you watch this and you like it, join us. We welcome you. Thank you, Professor Moreno. Take notes. This is a, a teaching moment. Um, and also a, a great day to just learn about all of these theories, legal theories. Thank you again, welcome, and we'll hold the um, questions for the end and we'll come back at the end. I turn it to our very own Department of Legal Studies, Professor Moreno. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dennis, for all your marvelous work. Uh, I see some uh, names I recognize on the list of people that are with us. So I want to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, webinar on freedom of speech and the First Amendment. A little bit about me. Most of you know me. Some of you know me. But I'll, for those of you who don't know me, uh, of course, a professor here at ASA College and have uh, also been teaching at the uh, City University of New York um, for a number of years. Um, I've also practiced uh, law with a particular emphasis on human rights. And, and that practice, the practice of human rights, it's what actually led me to get deeply involved in the issue of freedom of speech. Um, I think that the, um, you know, the, the first thing to be said is that uh, the issue of freedom of speech, it's enormous. The, the topic itself covers a whole range of issues from the text of the First Amendment, which we will read, but it also covers constitutional analysis. It covers textualist versus 
living constitutional arguments, and it covers a whole range of cases that have been decided by the U.S. Supreme Court and which informed the way we look at freedom of speech uh, in the United States. Um, I think the best thing to do uh, is to start by uh, stating the obvious, and that is that we are uh, lucky, uh, although we may not see it that way, but we're lucky to uh, live in a country where we are able to express our opinions, to criticize our governments, question authority. We can even call our president's names. And that's okay, but that's not okay everywhere in the world. And as we are sitting here, there are people all over the world who are in jail because they've dared to question authority, to write or publish uh, opinions that uh, people in government are not uh, happy to hear. Now, that is not to say that we are a perfect country. Of course, we know we're not. Uh, the founding fathers knew we were not, and that's why they had certain safeguards in place. Um, and if you read, for example, John Adams, our second uh, president, he was very blunt in terms of saying, look, uh, Americans can be as despicable as anybody else. And so he, the founding generation, the people who actually put this country together understood that there were limitations in terms of what we should, as a people, allow the government uh, to do. And, and the First Amendment, freedom of speech, it's really the cornerstone of the American democratic experiment. And if we don't have it, we don't have a democracy. Now, we've, we've, th there's been issues with uh, freedom of speech in America. We've had periods of American history where it's been challenged, it's been questioned. Um, but generally speaking, um, we live in a country where within the confines of constitutional restrictions and administrative presidents, we can pretty much say whatever we want. And, you know, I'll, it's not an absolute right. And we'll look at uh, some of the limitations that exist. But generally speaking, you know, we, we're pretty much free to, to challenge uh, government, to question authority without fear of being prosecuted. Uh, because we are questioning that authority. And as I said, um, it's, it's, it's not, this is not to say that the United States is a perfect country. It's an imperfect country. It's an imperfect experiment. Uh, but in terms of the of, of freedom of speech, I think we're um, ahead of a whole host um, of other nations. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that freedom of speech is difficult. It's nasty. It can get very nasty. Um, and in fact, in the course of this presentation, you uh, may hear things that will make you uncomfortable. You may look at images that may uh, make you uncomfortable. But that's what free speech is all about. Uh, the, the idea is that we should be able to express our views, to express our art, music, uh, whatever it is that we're interested in without fear of being prosecuted because what we believe in or the music we like or the movies we like to watch are, um, you know, objectionable to, uh, to some people. Um, so every democratic society like the United States has to uh, deal with the issue of how much speech should we have? What should we allow people, how much should we allow people to say? And what you need to do is to understand that there needs to be a balance between censorship, which is given the power to the government to say what we can say and not say, and free speech. Understanding that at times some of the things that people say are going to be hurtful, uh, nasty, in poor taste, all of those things. But you need, that needs to be a place for people to say those things. And one of the things that we're going to look at is how in the throughout the existence of the American democratic experiment there have been times when some people say, well, no, we don't think we should allow that sort of thing. And we're going to look at some of those, um, some of those restrictions in our history. Um, now, um, so how do we do this? How are we going to get through this? It's a lot of material. 
Uh, but this is how uh, we're going to get through it. Uh, first, uh, we're going to look at a series of quotes on uh, freedom of speech. Uh, and these quotes come from Americans, but also some quotes from people from other places. And the idea is to uh, provide a, a, a multi-generational, um, international uh, perspective on freedom of speech. Uh, our freedom of speech tradition is actually not um, natively American. It's actually, it comes from the British tradition. Uh, and so we need to be aware of what other people are thinking, were thinking uh, at other times in history. So we're going to start by looking at uh, some of those uh, quotes, and we're going to go to right to one of them right now. Now, the first, uh, before we get to the quotes, uh, we're going to start with the image of the First Amendment, which is the constitutional provision that deals with freedom uh, of speech in the American context. And we're going to get into it further. Um, there's also, um, it's important for us to know that not everybody, even the founding fathers, were not all in agreement about freedom of speech. So you have three people here. Well, you got four, but only three of them were founding fathers. The guy on the left, obviously, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, the guy on the right, James Madison. These two guys, and particularly Jefferson, were people who were devoted to freedom of speech, understood that in order to have a successful democratic experiment, you needed to have freedom of speech. Um, Hamilton, at the bottom there, you see him with um, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who is the, the guy who created the Broadway uh, musical Hamilton, was not so thrilled. Uh, he sort of, he was thinking, well, why do we need an amendment? Why do we need a First Amendment on freedom of speech? And part of the reason why he was sort of questioning freedom of speech was because he felt that the federal government, which remember, this was a new beginning. It's a new nation. They were putting this thing together and they didn't know how it was going to work out. But he felt that the federal government was never going to be so powerful that it could take away people's right to, to speak. And of course, we know differently. It, it became incredibly powerful. Um, so what I wanted you to get from this is that there's been dispute about First Amendment issues in America from the very beginning of the country. Some people wanted it. Some people didn't want it. And they're still, we're still pretty much there today. Um, now, the next slide. Um, Again, Jefferson, uh, there's no justification for taking away uh, individuals' freedom uh, in the guise of public safety. Now, um, I'm sure you're familiar, most of you are familiar with Thomas Jefferson, and you know he wrote the Declaration of Independence, and is probably one of our most uh, significant founding fathers. He was not a perfect man, of course. Um, you know, he owned slaves, uh, as everybody knows. But what I've always said is that Jefferson is one of those people without whom this experiment that we call America um, could not have happened, at least not in the way that it evolved. And one of the things that Jefferson was adamant about was freedom of speech. And his position was, I don't care what the government is interested in. I don't think that there should be any justification to take away people's right to free speech. Even if you're talking about public safety, national security. Now, this is what you call a brilliant intellect, because this man, it's writing the 18th century. Now, what he's saying here is that whenever you see a legislation, a government proposing legislation to limit um, people's ability to express their views, whether spoken or, or, or in writing, that you should be suspicious because even though it, it may appear that there is a valid justification to have uh, these restrictions on your freedom of speech, um, it's generally a way to limit the ability of the people to question the government, to question authority. Now, um, 
And one of the things that, one of the reasons why I think that Jefferson is so brilliant, well, I happen to, to think that he is probably the most brilliant of the founding fathers, again, with his faults and all. But when he's talking about not taking people's freedom of speech uh, away from them under the guise of public safety, something happened uh, in America in uh, 1970. There was a case, um, case was known as uh, the New York Times versus the United States, uh, also known as the Pentagon Papers. And here's what, what happened. Uh, President Nixon um, at the time, uh, you know, we were at war in Vietnam. And the New York Times and the Washington Post got hold of some papers having to do with American operations in Vietnam. And they wanted to publish that information. But President Nixon said, you can't publish that. That's treason. You can't do that. If you do that, you are going to put our troops at risk. Now, there is the public safety, the safety national security argument. Eventually, the case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know what? They can publish it. And, of course, they did. This is what, what Jefferson was thinking about in the 18th century, when he said that he didn't want freedom of speech to be taken away under the guise of public safety or national security. He was talking about the need to avoid prior censorship, which is what President Nixon wanted to do. In other words, you're running a newspaper and the government comes in and tells you, listen, you can't publish that stuff. It's not good for us. So what people like Jefferson and what the Supreme Court said in the Pentagon Papers case is, we don't care that you don't want it. That's the whole point of free speech, is to be able to say the things that the government does not necessarily want you to say. And so uh, we're going to hear about Jefferson quite a bit uh, in the course of this lecture. Let's move on to another one of the founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin. Um, were also one of the great intellect. And, and notice what he says. Freedom of speech is a principal pillar of free government. When this support is taken away, the constitution of free society is dissolved and tyranny is erected in its ruins. So in other words, as far as Ben Franklin understood it, you must have freedom of speech if you're going to have democracy. Because the minute you take away the people's ability to question the government, to question authority, that what you have is not democracy, is tyranny. Moving right along. Um, so we're going to go to England now. So everybody we saw, we've seen so far was Americans, founding fathers. Uh, George Orwell it was British, uh, and he was a writer. He was not a politician. He was a writer. And he's best known for uh, the novel 1984. And it's a novel, uh, it's a dystopian novel in which he um, that created this whole notion of Big Brother and, and government intrusion into people's lives. Now, here again is someone who is able to see ahead of his time. And notice what he says here. In liberty means anything at all. It means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. That's the whole, that's the core principle of freedom of speech, that I should be able to tell you what I think about you or your policies or about anything about you, even if you're not happy to hear it, because that's the whole point. That is, you need, people need to be able to say in a democratic society what they agree and disagree with regardless of the government or anybody in power or any cultural groups within society uh, are happy about it. So we're moving on now from England to France and we got Voltaire. And Voltaire is basically is known as a philosopher. And I, I must say, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, that this quote uh, where he says, I do not agree with what you have to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say, has been attributed to uh, different people. It's been attributed to Oscar Wilde, the Irish playwright, and to Benito Juarez, the president of, of uh, Mexico in the late 
19th century. But I, based on my research, I think I am attributing it to him uh, because I think, I mean, the, the sources I checked appears to indicate that he's the one who said it. Um, the main point of this is to, I mean, what Voltaire here is saying is, I may think that you're absolutely, that what you're saying is absolutely ridiculous and stupid. And, 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 I, and I may totally disagree with everything you're saying, but in order to have a democratic society, I have to be in a position to defend your right to say that, regardless of how stupid or ridiculous I think it is. Um, let's move on now to seven. Um, and now this is sort of, I chose this because um, Kierkegaard was, of course, a well-known Danish philosopher, but I think he was also particularly arrogant. Um, and I think we, by reading this, you're not sure where he stands. And he says people demand freedom of speech as a compensation for the freedom of thought, which they seldom use. That's the kind of thing that a, that a philosopher would say. But I thought it was important to include it because, um, first of all, to illustrate the fact that the people who oppose freedom of speech are not necessarily all people who are illiterate or ill-educated. You could hardly find a brighter person than Kierkegaard. And it seems to me from, from what I know about him and, and the quote that is not, he was not particularly uh, thrilled. Um, moving right along to eight, um, you're looking at a picture and a quote from a guy named Salman Rushdie. Or Salman Rushdie was born in England, but he um, made his career as a writer, as a novelist um, in England. And he actually lives here now uh, in America. And Rushdie knows a, a thing or two about freedom of speech from personal experience. Um, he wrote a book called The Satanic Verses, a novel, just, you know, um, it's kind of like magic realism type of novel. But there were some people um, who were very upset about the novel. They felt, um, and particularly um, the Ayatollah um, Khomeini, who was the... the um, religious leader of Iran at the time, felt that the novel insulted uh, Islam, that it uh, presented uh, Muhammad, which is the uh, prophet of uh, the Islamic uh, religion, in a negative light, and that he was blasphemous, that it was an insult. So what um, the Ayatollah did was that he issued something called a fatwa, which is kind of like putting, you know, taking out a contract on someone. In other words, he was, the Ayatollah was basically saying to Muslims across the world, find this guy and kill him. And the reason for it was because he was pissed at the novel, the satanic verses, because if he felt that it insulted Islam, that it insulted uh, Muhammad. Of course, Rushdie explained that that was not his intention, that the novel actually doesn't insult. And I actually, I've read it and it doesn't. Uh, but the bottom line is that it illustrates the difficulties of dealing with the society where freedom of speech is not allowed, it's not tolerated. So Rashti lived, he still is under threat. I mean, this happened quite a bit. The novel was published in 88, but he's still um, under a threat of um, a fatwa. Um Coming back to America now, but to also um, the, the 19th century, Frederick Douglass, um, the well-known abolitionist, um, and, and a guy who understood also, like Rushdie, uh, many, you know, a century later, but uh, Frederick Douglass understood the importance of freedom of speech. He was an abolitionist, meaning someone who worked to end slavery in the United States. And actually, it was forbidden in certain parts of the United States, particularly the American South, to speak against slavery. In other words, if you gave a speech against slavery, you could be arrested. Uh, that's if you were lucky, uh, because you could also be executed uh, if some of the terrorist organization, which are prevalent at the time, um, got a hold of you. 
Uh, and so Douglas says that to suppress free speech is a double wrong. It's twice wrong uh, because it violates the rights of the hearer uh, as well as those of the speaker. In other words, I, I want to hear what everybody has to say. So if you silence someone, you're not only denying that person the right to speak, but you're also denying me the right to hear what he or she has to say. Uh, let's move right along here to Okay, now you're looking at a picture and a quote by Patrick Henry. He's not very well known. Um, you know, he's not he's one of the founding fathers. Um, but most people, I think if you ask most American about, you know, if they knew who Patrick Henry was, probably don't know. But he was a, a critical person in the um, American revolutionary process. In other words, when American was trying to become an independent country um, and, 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 and kick the English out. And he was a very, very powerful in terms of his speech. Uh, and he's known for these phrase, um, I know not what others may choose, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death, which is, which is a very radical statement. And most of the um, first American, first, first amendment, American, um, jurisprudence that we've learned and that we've uh, reviewed throughout the centuries that the country has existed, in a sense, began with this idea, with Patrick Henry saying, because remember, he said this before Washington said it. He even said it before Jefferson said it. So I think it's, it's, it's critical in terms of America's um, freedom of expression tradition, uh, because he was radical. He was he was willing to say it in a way that you understood what he meant. He was not going to use intellectual language. He was going to speak it like, like it is, like it was. Now, this slide um, it's interesting, and I chose it because it illustrates how difficult freedom of speech is. Sometimes people would say very hateful things to you, to your face. Um, and I certainly, you know, I've heard those things um, and it's not pretty. And so if you look at uh, the guy on the extreme right, uh, it's Ben Franklin. Because the guy in the middle is saying somebody needs to stop this vicious hate speech. Uh, you know, whether America first, ban Muslim, build the wall. And, and Ben Franklin is basically saying, no, 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 wait a minute. They have a right to be wrong. That's part of what freedom of speech is about. In other words, under our Constitution and based on our judicial opinions, hate speech is protected. You cannot prosecute someone because they're racist, homophobic, anti-immigrants, anti-LGBT, you cannot. In other words, the Constitution actually protects those people's right to be hateful. And as I said, this is why I said earlier that freedom of speech is difficult because it's okay, it's comfortable when you're talking to people that agree with you or people that only vaguely disagree with you. But when someone is calling you a rapist, because you are of a particular ethnic group or a particular sexual orientation. It's a problem. It's difficult to take, but that's the price you pay to live in a democratic society. That's why I thought this, um, this slide was, um, was important. Um, and of course, I don't have to tell you what this is, um, but I will. Um, and these images are the part of the January 6th insurrection. I, I realize that not everybody likes the word insurrection, but that's the word that I'm going with. Um, there are some people who feel that these folks were, should be referred to as protesters. I disagree. And there again is a manifestation of freedom of speech. Um, we're going to come back to this uh, at the end of the lecture because this is important. When people went to try to uh, prevent a peaceful transfer of power um, in the United States, 
that's an attack on freedom of speech. So we're going to come back to this for two reasons. One, because this was really not First Amendment, uh, First Amendment activity, what these folks did uh, when they uh, stormed the Capitol. Uh, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to explain to you later on why it is not but I'll give you briefly um, an idea of why it isn't. The First Amendment protects your ability, your freedom to express your ideas. It does not protect your decision to engage in criminal conduct. So if you're destroying property, that's not protected. It doesn't matter that at the time you destroy that property, you were advocating uh, for a particular political candidate. That's not the point. The First Amendment protects the message, not criminal conduct. And we're going to come back to that um, in a bit. I mentioned um, earlier that um, the American, our American uh, First Amendment and the Bill of Rights as a whole actually comes from England. Um, even though America gained its uh, independence from England, a lot of the foundational documents of the United States were actually based on the British tradition. And that includes the Bill of Rights and that includes the English uh, Bill of Rights. So that's where, that's where we get it from. It's not our creation. Now, this slide um, is very important because here we're going to get to read the text of the First Amendment. This is the text which guides what we as Americans believe in, in terms of freedom of speech. Um, as I mentioned earlier, not everybody was crazy about this freedom of speech thing. Uh, and, and people like Hamilton, and there were other founding fathers who said, we don't need it. So, you know, get over it. And of course, Jefferson was there pushing and saying, we do need it. And eventually he prevailed, and that's why we have it. Now, the text says, Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. Now, we're going to, it covers a whole range of other things like religion, but we're going to concentrate on speech, uh, freedom of speech. Um, but notice that it says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then right next to that, abridging the freedom of speech. So it doesn't say that the government cannot regulate speech. They can and they do. And we'll see how they do. So the first thing we get from the language uh, of the First Amendment is that it's not an absolute power. There are limits. The government can regulate. Uh, speech and, and does. Um, just briefly, um, I've, I've already mentioned this, but I just want to uh, summarize it, uh, about the, the function, the importance of freedom of speech. The idea is that freedom of speech is needed in a democratic society because it allows us to criticize our government. How are we going to challenge um, government policies that we disagree with. We don't have, a, a, you know, a freedom of speech to express this idea without fear of reprisals. Uh, but we've, uh, we've covered this. Now, um, the other thing to understand is that when we're talking about speech, we're not just talking about words. Sometimes uh, speech is art, it's dance, it's music, entertainment, theater. You ever heard of rap music? There's been a lot of controversy about rap music. Some people say the lyrics are offensive, insulting to, to women, to certain people, and they want to ban. Well, the problem with that sort of an attitude is that the minute you start doing that, where are you going to stop? And I've chosen a, a couple of, um, you know, a work of art, and a couple of movies um, that I that created uh, controversy when they were created. The first one on the 
on your left is Picasso's Les Damoiselles d'Avignon. And this was a painting. Now, Picasso, you know, he's a painter. That's what he does. And he came up with this thing called Cubism, which is a, a new style of painting. So he came up with this work of art. But some people were pretty upset. And they said, what the hell is he doing? This is insulting. It's showing these women. They're naked. And this is not how we are used to seeing women. That needs to be banned. This guy needs to be punished. Now, of course, over the decades, this was written at the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, today it's considered to be one of the greatest work of art. But at the time, there were some people who strongly objected to it. So when you suppress speech, you also suppress art. Um, if you look at the, moving to the right, um, The Last Temptation of Christ. I remember going to the theater in Times Square to see this film. And people protesting outside. And the I, again, this was sort of a, a, the Christian version of the satanic verses that I spoke about earlier. There were, um, the Catholic Church in America was very upset about the film. It's a, it's a film uh, which, um, in which it's about Jesus Christ. But as the Catholics and other Christian fundamentalists saw it, it painted Jesus Christ in a negative light uh, because it, it essentially, what Scorsese said, it, he's trying to humanize Christ. But never, you know, regardless of whether we agree with what Scorsese is saying, that's not the point. The point is, this is a work of art. You don't like it, don't watch it. Go home. But there are people who are intent on imposing their values, their philosophies, their views on others. Um, and so there's a lot of controversy. And the last image um, well, actually, above, right above the last temptation of Christ, it's a warning, explicit language. This is what, what's actually posted on some of the rap lyrics uh, that people find offensive. And the last image, uh, Streisand. Um, I don't know if you recognized her in that outfit. Um, you know, great actress, great singer. And um, she made a movie called Yentl, a great movie. Uh, but in that movie, she plays a woman who dresses like a man uh, to study the scripture. Because in the Jewish tradition, women were not allowed. So there was, a again, some people in the conservative Orthodox Jewish community were not thrilled. They felt that the movie insulted the Torah. They, I mean, there were all sorts of things um, that were thrown at Streisand. Eventually, uh, you know, the, the movie prevailed, and until today, it's one of the greatest uh, works of art. So I wanted it, what I wanted it to, to get, to, for you to get out of this, is to see how speech is not only about words. It's about art, and it's about how if you allow people, government, or powerful groups within a society to um, limit that speech, but you're denying uh, other people the enjoyment of that art or music or theater. You don't like the movie? Don't watch it. You don't like the lyrics of the song? Listen to something else and move on. Now, um, what I wanted to, this slide talks about the First Amendment um, and looking at it as a, as, a, as a textualist. And what I mean here is that I want you to understand that there is more than one way to read a text. Um, and a constitutional text, um, like the First Amendment, can be read from a textualist perspective, which is, look at the text, what does it mean? What do the words mean? But there are some people who say, well, you can't really go by that because this text was written in the 18th century. This is the 21st century. Those words don't mean today, what they meant back then. And of course, one of the things that we've done in terms of uh, First Amendment uh, issues is that the Supreme Court has uh, you know, interpreted 
the First Amendment in different ways throughout history. And the idea is to, to um, rely on the Supreme Court to guide us uh, in terms of how the language, the text should be interpreted. And it varies depending on the philosophy of the justices in the Supreme Court. Um, in terms of what it covers, what what the um, First Amendment, um, what, what it protects, it protects your right to gather information, to maintain ideas and beliefs, to communicate ideas to your friends, to other people, to engage in ideological silence. Uh, for example, if you go to a school where they do the Pledge of Allegiance before they start class, but you don't want to do it. You don't want to do Pledge of Allegiance. You should have the right to do that. Um, e, um, engage in symbolic speech, taking an E during a national anthem. Um, actually, um, I was hoping you would be able to see um, the football players. Um, I'm sure you've, some of you have seen this. Colin Kaepernick started this tradition of not standing up, not um, singing the national anthem, but actually taking an E as a sign of protest. Um, you know, against racism and, 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 you know, systemic racism in America. Again, some people not happy. Some people saying, what the hell is he doing? He's paid to play football, so he needs to go and play football. Um, and related to this, by the way, <clears throat> he's been fined by the National Football League for doing this. And students sometimes ask me, uh, well, professor, if there's freedom of speech, why is he required to pay? Why, why are they allowed to fine him? And of course, the answer is that the First Amendment only applies to governmental action. It doesn't apply to private businesses, and the NFL is a private business, so they can pretty much do as they please. Um, and then towards the end there, um, um, F, you can engage in mute conduct, like you want to wear a Nazi uniform, like this is a member of the British royal family. He thinks that's cool. Well, some of us think it's in poor taste. So what? Has a right to do that. And that's what he want to do. That's the price of freedom of speech. Here is an interesting case. Um, I remember this case. Um, and it's known as the flag burning case. Texas v. Johnson. Now, this was the case in which the Supreme Court addressed the issue of whether you have a constitutionally protective right under the First Amendment to burn an American flag. And it, it arose out of a situation in um, Texas with this guy named Gregory Johnson, whom you see here at the bottom with his lawyer. Um, Johnson is the younger guy. Uh, the guy to his right is William Counsel, who's a well-known New York lawyer. I think he's passed, uh, passed away. But anyway, he um, didn't like Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was a Republic, very popular Republican president um, in the eighties, and uh, there was he was you know was a, there was a re-election campaign going on. So he decided that the way he was going to express his disagreement with Reagan politics was to burn an American flag. So he did, and um, he was arrested, prosecuted by the state of Texas. Or desecrating a national symbol. And of course, you can understand how upset some people were that he was burning an American flag. But he, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know what? He can. He should. Yeah, he has a right to do that. Again, the whole idea, this is Orwell's point. If freedom of speech means anything, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. And again, some of what uh, Johnson did was in poor taste. And uh, I, I have people in my family who absolutely despise that the Supreme Court didn't put him in jail for life. But Justice Brennan, you see here, basically said, well, look, freedom of speech entails giving people the right to do things that most of us find objectionable. And that's the case here. This guy is burning an American flag and he's saying some pretty nasty things about the United States. But if you want to have a democratic society, you need to give people like that the right to say and do what it is that they want to do. 
there are, um, of course, limitations in freedom of speech. There are things that you cannot do, things that are, are not protected. Uh, one of them is obscenity. Uh, child pornography is also uh, one of the categories that are not uh, protected. Um, moving down the line, fighting words. Um, the lead case there is a case known as Chaplinsky v. New Hampshire. Um, and it's about fighting words. In other words, words that are spoken in a face-to-face -face encounter and which are likely to provoke a violent reaction. That's not protected speech. Um, and also um, speech integral to uh, violent, uh, to, to likely to instigate violent action. And this, this particular speech came out of uh, at LBJ, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was, was a president of the United States in the, in the 60s. And a guy said, um, you know, it was a guy who was called for the draft. And he said, if you give me a rifle, um, I'll kill LBJ. And, um, you know, so people felt that obviously some people were offended. But then there were other people who said, well, so what? That's what he wants to say. He doesn't like uh, President Johnson. Um, leave him alone. Let him be. Another standard um, which made it illegal for you to engage in a particular type of conduct, which means it falls under the category of speech that's not protected, is something called the clear and present danger standard. And it arose out of a case known as Schenck v. United States. So again, not every form of speech is protected by the First Amendment. Um, Defamation is not protected. So, you know, if you're spreading rumors um, about someone um, you, which ruins their reputation, that person can actually take you to court. That's Sean Penn. He did that to a newspaper and was actually um, successful. Um, and then the here is something that is protected, but that a lot of people think should not be. And this uh, arose out of a case known as Brandenburg v. Ohio. And uh, with this, this was a case where a guy, a member of the KKK, said some pretty hateful things. Uh, if you look here, I'm going to read it real quick for you. This is what he said. If our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court continues to suppress the white Caucasian race, it's possible that there may have to be some revengeance taken. Uh, the niggers should return to Africa. The Jews should, return to, um, should be returned to Israel. That's pretty hateful stuff. And most of us would say, this guy should go to jail. So he was arrested. He was convicted. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, you know what? He can say that. That's okay. We're okay with it. That's constitutionally protected speech. So hate speech is constitutionally protected. Even if it offends. And I'm sure these words that I just threw out at you offends some of you. They certainly offend me, but that's the price of living in a democratic society. Hate speech is protected. We don't like it. It's offensive. It's annoying. It's hurtful, but it's permissible. It's constitutionally protected. Um, yeah, I'm done kind of rushing because uh, we're approaching the end, but I wanted to um, just make a mention of the fact that commercial speech is protected, but it has limited protection. So what you're looking at here is the warnings that are um, printed on cigarettes, um, boxes, packages. Um, now, if you're in the tobacco business, you might raise an argument. You might be opposed to this. You might say, why is the government forcing me to put these warnings on my cigarettes? People are not going to buy them. I'm going to lose money. I thought this was a capitalist country where, you know, the government was supposed to respect private property. So there is some protection for commercial speech, but it is, uh, it is limited. Um, okay, I'm going to skip through. But I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on this before we finish. Um, did you know, for example, that it is illegal to panhandle in the New York City subway system? In other words, you get on the train asking for change. Now, there was a lawsuit that was filed on First Amendment grounds. And the city of New York actually won the lawsuit because the court said, okay, we we agree that this that New York cannot ban begging or panhandling everywhere in the state.
but they're allowed to do it within the uh, transportation system. Now, of course, we see it a lot, so we think it's legal. It's not, uh, even though there was a First Amendment challenge that was, uh, that was raised. Uh, I mentioned this, but I want to repeat it again. Private property is not subject to First Amendment uh, activity. Uh, and, and, and also related to this, First Amendment only applies to governmental action, um, not private businesses or private property. Um, okay, I've already mentioned this. This is Rush D. This is the guy who wrote the Satanic Verses I mentioned to you before, and the Ayatollah is the guy uh, under it. Uh, which put out a con took out a contract on a Rushdie to have him killed because he disagreed. The Ayatollah disagreed with the content of the novel that he felt insulted uh, Islam. Again, the consequences of um, not having freedom uh, of expression. Um, Hannah Arendt was a well-known, probably one of the greatest um, 20th century political theorists. But she wrote this book called uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, which is Eichmann was one of the, you know, a Nazi and, and they caught him in Argentina and they brought him and they put him on trial uh, in Israel. She wrote a book called The Banality, you know, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, The Banality of Evil. And some people objected to the phrase, the banality of evil, because they understood that she, of course, they, they were totally wrong, but they, they understood that she was saying that in a sense, Eichmann, who was a despicable man, was really not evil. She wasn't saying that at all. But again, it, it goes to show if you allow uh, restrictions to be placed, then you deprive people of the writings of uh, people like, like Hannah Arendt. And, uh, you know, we don't, I don't think that's something that we should uh, do. Um, and the last thing. Um, we, I, I show you images of the January 6th um, insurrection in the beginning of, uh, of our talk. Uh, and so I'm, I'm titling this in my end is my beginning, which is a quote from a T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot was an American poet. Um, but I, I'm bringing this up uh, to say that what happened in uh, Washington, D.C. on January 6th uh, was a tragic event. And I think it was tragic for First Amendment purposes. I think it was tragic for democratic purposes, for the for the uh, the health of our democracy. Um, and um, I, I wanted us to to think about it. First of all, this was not First Amendment activity. This was criminal activity, as far as I'm concerned. Of course, somebody could disagree. Uh, you know, we have time now to go to the Q and A. If you feel that that it was uh, that it was First Amendment action, but you can prove me wrong. But it, that, I'm just telling you how I feel on the issue. Um, and so every democratic society, including ours, needs to decide whether we are going to have free speech or censorship. The people who founded this country, Jefferson, Adam, Washington, Madison, they believe that we should be on the side of free speech and not censorship. And I think those guys knew what they were talking about. So I'm going to go with that. And I'm going to end it here. If we have, I don't know if we'll have time because I might have gone over. Uh, but Dennis would probably tell us. Dennis is the gentleman who's helping us. Absolutely. So if there are Absolutely. questions, I'm happy to take them on them. We do, we do. We have a very, we have an amazing audience today. They're asking a great question. We have lots of questions. I hope we can cover all of them today. Um, Professor Carlos Miranda, thank you so much for an amazing presentation. Everyone is loving it. Uh, the audience is asking great questions and we're going to start ad addressing them soon. Sure. Now I'm looking at some and, of the questions. Um, are you going to um, indicate which questions we should? Yeah, address? I'm going to kick off the question and answer mode. So our first question. One second. Uh, 
All right, so here's our first question. It should be on the screen yes, in a I'm few seconds. It. Sure. And um, Perfect. the question says, it seems there is a fine line between freedom of speech and defamation and hate speech. Um, and it, it, where is it? Um, I think that as it relates to defamation uh, and, and hate speech, I believe that there is an interplay. Um, however, hate speech per se, it's speech that's generally offensive to a particular segment. Defamation is more of an individualized situation in which someone publishes or says something to you, you know, against you or something that ruins your reputation. And so the difference is that hate speech is more of a general group based kind of speech, while defamation, it's an individualized um, sort of speech, which is why the court, Supreme Court has said that it does not uh, deserve First Amendment protection. Um, and I, I guess we're ready for the next question if there is time. Okay, and I see um, another question. Um, do we have a, a limit speed for uh, free speech? Um, and it, I, I'm going to answer the question as I understand it. Uh, if the question is whether uh, there is a limit um, on freedom of speech, of course there is, and we, we listed some of the limitations. So fighting words are not protected. Defamation is not protected. Pornography is not protected. So there's a whole host of, um, of, of issues which are not uh, constitutionally protected. Uh, the next question uh, from uh, Karina is, um, can artists do everything they want in the name of art? And, you know, the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is that as long as the art, it does not violate any legislation or establish, um, you know, uh, norms or rules in a particular community, that that is generally okay. So, for example, I remember years ago in New York, there was um, a, a, an exhibit, uh, which was a live exhibit um, at a gallery, where it was a guy urinating on a photograph of Christ. And, of course, you can imagine the reaction. Uh, and, uh, you know, the case, this came, the case went all the way um, to the Supreme Court. And the, the, the decision was, that's protected you don't like that, that offends you, it offends your values, your religion, don't watch it, go somewhere else. Um, Judith uh, asks, uh, can you have the right of freedom of speech at your, uh, your job place? It depends, uh, Judith. If you um, work for the government, yes. However, if you work for me and I have a private company, no. For example, suppose you work for, let's say you work for Chase Bank and you have a poster of Donald Trump on your desk and the manager says, you got to take it out, take it off, take it down. We don't, we don't do that sort of thing here. Can they do that? Yes, they can because they're not the government. And First Amendment protections apply to government action. And so whether or not your freedom of speech at work is protected depends on who you work for. If you work for a private company, no. If you work for the government, yes. Um, Christian asked, uh, what about pat smoking? Uh, what about uh, promoting rather um, known lies about the government? Okay, this is an interesting question because it sounds on the surface of it like defamation, but it's not. Um, lies about the government means that I'm saying, let's say I'm saying what I think about this government. Suppose I don't like uh, President Biden and I say horrible things about him and they could be totally untrue. 
Um, but that's protected speech. That, that's protected speech, actually, under the First Amendment. They would say that I have a right, even if what I'm doing is lying about him. Even if I'm saying, look, he's those vaccine that he's, you know, that they're putting on you, they've got all these horrible things, so please don't, don't, don't take the vaccine. And there are people who say that. That's protected. Uh, the next one, uh, Leilani uh, asks, uh, who has the right to declare someone is behaving in a transphobic manner? How can you educate people uh, to not pass judgment on others based on their bias and feeling? Now, of course, there is a difference between educating people and government action. Again, I think that we should educate people to be respectful of others, uh, regardless of sexual orientation or race or, or uh, political opinion or anything of that sort. Um, the way to deal with that is to make sure that our schools include training programs, classes, courses that teach about these issues. However, you cannot take it to the next level and say, okay, we're going to pass legislation, which would uh, make it possible for someone to be arrested if they make uh, derogative comments about people of a particular uh, sexual orientation. Um, okay, Rodini, I believe is the name, ask, um, what do you think about China's power growing up? Um, and is it a threat to our freedom? Uh, if yes, um, how we can preserve it uh, from it? And of course, I'm assuming that um, the question deals with um, the Chinese government. Uh, there are obviously a lot of people who feel that there are violations of um, freedom of speech in China. Uh, I have to admit that I'm not uh, particularly familiar with the Chinese situation, well, not sufficient anyway to make an assessment as to whether or not there are such violations, but I, I have heard them. I have um, read and heard that there are such violations of freedom of speech by uh, the Chinese government. But as I said, I can't comment on it because I'm not, it would be improper for me to comment without having the proper knowledge. Okay, and uh, Jan Veda, who's actually one of my students, asks, uh, do I believe that uh, politics, it's more infusing now uh, because of free speech? I think, you know, free speech, it's always, it allows for people to be open about what they believe. And I think that's a good thing. Even when some of the things they believe annoy us, even when we disagree with the things they believe in, uh, but, you know, we, I go back to the words of Frederick Douglass when he said, you know, I, I, I think that when you limit people's freedom of speech, you're denying the speaker and the listener at the same time. When it comes to politics, I'm all for people being out there expressing what it is they believe. You believe Donald Trump was the greatest president that ever lived? I want you to have the right to say that. You believe that he was the worst president that ever lived? I also want you to have the right to say that. Um, got a question from Marcella. Um, rejecting to take COVID-19 vaccine is, uh, I think the question is whether uh, rejecting uh, to take COVID-19 vaccine is, um, freedom of speech. Um, I think the, there's the issue with the vaccine is that there is a public health issue. Um, and actually, every time there's a pandemic, when there's a well-known case from the beginning of the century when chickenpox was an issue, uh, in which people, there was a guy who actually took a case all the way to the Supreme Court because he didn't want to take the vaccine because he felt that it, uh, you know, it did something to him, that it annoyed, it offended his religious orientation. So here we have, this is an ongoing debate. Um, I think that re refusing to take the vaccine in America so far is not a crime. It does limit your ability to do things like in New York City now, it, it seems that if you uh, do not take, the, if you don't have the vaccine, you can't uh, 
go indoor to, you know, to a restaurant or to a Broadway show or to sporting events. Uh, but it's a, it's, there's a debate, there's an ongoing debate. And I think I come down on the side of the government being able to require, but this is just my personal opinion. I could be totally wrong, but I think the government should be in a position not to criminalize, I'm not going that far, but that the government should be in a position to um, encourage, let's put it that way, encourage people to um, take the vaccine. Because you're, the, where I'm going uh, with this is that when you refuse to take the vaccine, it's not just an individual choice that you're making. If you're not taking the vaccine, you're putting other people uh, at risk. And so that's why it's not really an individual freedom of speech, individual right kind of argument, uh, because there are other people uh, involved. Uh, Ling uh, Tong asks, are we allowed to celebrate a speech meeting for any topics? And the answer is yes. Um, speech, um, speech protection in the United States is so powerful that you can even say, like, for example, I could say to, to, let's say if we were doing this in person, I could say to you, I believe in the violent overthrow of the United States government. And that would be protected. As long as I'm not doing anything about it. Now, if I have a gun and I say to you, let's go to City Hall and storm the place, that's not protected. Because there's a potential of imminent criminal act uh, in what I'm saying. So generally, you could pretty much have a meeting about anything, as long as you don't cross the line into criminal conduct. Um, the next question is, is you don't know, John Lewis says, do people um, really, um, or are people really free nowadays, when we consider the government almost takes the COVID-19 vaccine mandatory, as we know, the man the mayor de Blasio. Okay, and I think this question goes to, relates to the issue, um, the question uh, raised before, uh, which is that you have to strike a balance between freedom of speech uh, at the individual level and public safety. And so it isn't so simple as to say, well, I should be able to refuse the vaccine and not suffer any consequences. Uh, because the First Amendment says that that's a manifestation of my freedom of speech. It, there has to be a balance with public safety. You have to, it has to be like an interplay between the two. Um, the next question, um, uh, this is uh, Jan Vera again. Why is, uh, that, why is it that terrorists are protected by freedom of speech when their acts are perpetuated over and over again. And of course, terrorism as an act, it's not protected. But if you, you know, but but I, I think um, where um, Jan Vetter is going with this question is that sometimes you would have people advocating terrorism and that somehow um, that should be, that there should be limits on that sort of advocacy. Uh, the problem with, putting limits on the advocacy when it doesn't entail an immediate, an imminent uh, threat of violence is that you then open the door for the government to define what is terroristic speech. So if I go to Washington Square and I make a speech against, um, you know, the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, and I say that those people should be um, executed and arrested and, and held without trial. Um, would that be considered terroristic speech? Some people would. Some people would say, well, that's terrorist. You're advocating terrorism because you're, in a sense, denying people their right. So I'm, I'm of the opinion that you, you should be allowed to say whatever it is you want to say, as long as you don't cross the line into engaging into criminal conduct. I mean, this is, this is what the Supreme Court said in the Brandenburg decision. 
when they when they got, remember the guy who said that he was going to take revenge on the Supreme Court and the and the president and the Congress if they didn't stop harassing uh, the white Caucasian race. And that was pretty hateful stuff, and it was he was threatening them. But the court said, but yeah, but that doesn't cross the line into criminal activity. So. Um, the next question we have, Sasha asked, do you believe the freedom of speech are sometimes biased based on the group that is expressing it? And why if yes? Um, in other words, do I believe that there are some people who enjoy more freedom of speech than others? I don't think so. I think that what happens is that depending on the composition, because at the end of the day, if there is a challenge, on the um, First Amendment freedom of a speech action, the case ends up at the Supreme Court. And what happens at the Supreme Court depends largely on the composition of the court. So generally, if you have a more conservative court, like the court we have now, uh, the person challenging the freedom of speech uh, regulation, it's probably going to have less of a success, less likelihood that it that you know, that the challenge would, would succeed. So I don't think it has to do with um, biased against one group. I, I think everybody has the same axis, but what eventually happens to your case depends on the political composition and the judicial philosophy of the people sitting at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, okay, the next one, uh, Darlena asks, is it, pro is it a proper policy for a democratic government to have a very broad interpretation of First Amendment uh, freedom of speech? Um, and it's, it's a very interesting question because um, the interpretation of the First Amendment in broad terms is actually democratic in its essence. Uh, it's when you limit the, the scope of the interpretation that we get into a problem. But remember that the decision as to whether the interpretation is uh, limited or overbroad, it's made by the courts, not necessarily. So it's not made by the executive, but it's made by the court. So if you present an argument uh, to the court, how the court decides that case will depend on judicial precedents, but also, again, on the judicial philosophy of the people deciding the case. Okay, and uh, the next question is Candy asks, do you believe the First Amendment is contradicting? Um, I don't think it is. It, I, th I believe it is complex, but I don't think it's contradicting. I think the First Amendment, the, the, looking at it as a textualist, the language is pretty clear. It's pretty clear and it's not contradictory. Um, the First Amendment clearly says that the government shall make no laws limiting um, the exercise of religion or abridging the, the right of the people to free speech. So it's not contradictory. Now, how it is interpreted may sometimes seem uh, contradictory to us because sometimes you may have a judicial decision which you feel uh, contradicts the spirit or the essence of the text. Uh, but the text itself is not contradictory. It's pretty simple, very simple, straightforward language. Thank you so much, Professor Moreno. We had and we have more questions coming in. However, we're limited with the time. And um, Sanya, question. would you like to say a few words? Um, Sanya, you are muted. If you could please unmute yourself. All right, so it seems like Sandy is a little bit busy. Uh, Professor Moreno, we had a uh, lots of lots of great questions, great compliments. Everyone loved the pres your presentation. You can look at the chat. There are lots Thank of great comments. 
great energy today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Professor Morena, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I just I want to uh, thank uh, every ben, uh, everyone who attended. I want to thank uh, Mr. Veras. I want to thank Dennis, who was instrumental. I have to tell you, when when um, we were uh, rehearsing this, Dennis and I, because uh, I'm not. Those of you who are my students know that you're not. I'm not very technologically inclined, but he made it possible, made it easy. Um, I appreciate the questions, and uh, and I'm glad that a lot of you came. And um, unfortunately, time is limited, so we couldn't get to all the questions, but I thank you for attending. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a great rest of the day and the week. Um, Saini Tavares left her contact information in the chat if you would like to learn more about um, our criminal justice degree or paralegal studies, please feel free to reach out to her. We'll be happy to see you at ASA. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.